why your company is unable to get investment and how you can get investors to run after you. Let's go! I'm happy to be on this podcast and talk to you about uh, you know what I'm doing in the venture cap and the startup world and uh, my uh, participation in this ecosystem uh, the one that is most active of course we have a lot of uh, participation through investments etc um, I've been an entrepreneur for a large part of my working career a second generation entrepreneur but specifically with respect to the startup movement and venture cap uh, my most active participation is through a fund called Transition Venture Capital. Um, Transition Venture Capital is a uh, early stage fund which is focused on uh, companies which are operating uh, in the clean energy slash decarbonization slash net zero segment. Uh, I am on the investment committee and I am also a, um, uh, an LP, so I'm also an investor. And um, for me, this has been uh, an area of uh, a lot of interest and passion uh, over my 20 years of working experience uh, in which I supplied a lot of capital equipment uh, to large industries, uh, the utilities, oil and gas. Um, and we now see all of that changing uh, towards a more cleaner world. And so that's the reason why I'm interested in it. Uh, I'm also studying it. I'm doing an executive master's degree in that area and I'm very happy uh, to work uh, with Transition Venture Capital on this. Large equipment and startups don't generally go hand in hand. Exactly. So I, I so exactly. So I said that was what I was doing in the past. That was uh, the business that I was running. Uh, but having been through that, I understand, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the variables around this uh, transition. And what are the reasons, uh, you know, why this transition is happening, etc. Uh, just to take this a step further, what we do at Transition Venture Capital. Um, so when you look at clean energy, and that's a very good point you make. Uh, when we talk about clean energy and we talk about decarbonization, we talk about net zero. Uh, we're basically talking about a very, very large outlay of assets. We're talking about large investments. We're talking about large companies. And we're talking about a lot of money. Uh, so that's a good question. How does uh, startup, uh, you know, how does the startup world come into all this? So basically, when you look at uh, clean energy, you can divide it into two parts, right? One is the deployment of assets, right? And that's always a big capital game. The other is the development of technology, which ultimately evolves into those assets, which are then deployed. And at Transition Venture Capital, we are looking at that technology development. Um, so around the world, uh, you know, when we look at things, uh, you know, the four largest uh, economies, economic groups, if you may say, which are uh, the biggest carbon emitters in the world uh, would be the US, China, India, and the European Union. And all of us have a huge deployment of assets but all of us are at different stages of development of technology. And all of us need different kinds of technology as well. And that's what we are trying to address at Transition Venture Capital. We're trying to accelerate, grow, uh, nurture that sector, which is going to create the technologies which are going to be deployed as assets tomorrow. I feel like... Again, it's the chicken and egg problem that what do you have first? You have the technology first or the deployment first? Because I think there's a fair few companies that we have spoken to as well who are trying to develop technologies that harness clean energy, to say so. But then the moment you think about, okay, how are you going to make money out of this? The ways that they have deployment are so rudimentary that they're not unscalable. I'll give you an example. Our, one of the latest episodes we have out is a biogas sort of enabler where they look into increasing efficiencies of biogas plants and figuring out ways that people can monetize their usage of biogas that they are producing. And one of the main uses is obviously for cooking and for you know your everyday needs in households. And for that, the transportation that they're using is something called a biogas balloon. It's a balloon that is filled up with one cubic meter of biogas or two cubic meters of biogas and then transported to the next household. And we were just having a conversation that that just sounds 
sound like something that only maybe five or ten people can do. Yeah, yeah. How else can you do it? You set up a pipeline. How expensive is setting up a pipeline? The fact is that a lot of clean energy uh, technology development uh, is constrained and dependent upon the infrastructure that will come in. That's just the fact of life. Um, basically, what we are trying to do is we are trying to change an existing order, right? We're, uh, when we're talking about clean energy, you're trying to change the way things are being done. Uh, again, when you talk about entrepreneurship or startups, there are two types of things, right? One is uh, what you call the blue ocean strategy, where you're trying to uh, go after a new market, a completely new concept. And so another one where you're trying to disrupt something. And nowhere is that more applicable than in, in, in clean tech or clean energy, where you're basically trying to disrupt an existing set of things, right? The world works. We get into our cars. We, we switch on the electricity. You know, everything works. Uh, but we want to change. We want to use different things uh, to do all of these things that we do. And so obviously we are constrained by infrastructure. If you look at, for example, hydrogen, which is touted as a multi-billion dollar, uh, you know, energy vector for tomorrow. Ultimately, it's also constrained by things like transportation, pipelines, storage. How are we going to do it? So this issue is applicable to a small startup doing biogas in balloons to somebody building a multi-billion dollar hydrogen plant. It's applicable everywhere. Don't you think the level of risk that someone new in the startup ecosystem, especially someone in green energy, is very, very high? Because the level of risk you take to invent something and that something may or may not work, you might pour in three, four years into the development of it and then not come out with anything sellable. So actually, to be honest, uh, I... Uh, I don't have the figures on me, but I think I've read, uh, uh, you know, snippets here and there. Uh, when you look at the total amount of money that is poured uh, globally into venture capital and startups, uh, and it, people have done research, uh, you know, obviously the, the most successful sectors are, uh, you know, th those linked with uh, consumer, uh, you know, consumer usage or, uh, you know, web-enabled services uh, or even sometimes fintech because these are basically addressing brand new things, like I said. Right? So you're addressing a brand new concept. Uh, and yes, you could either succeed or you could fail, right? Um, you're addressing a brand new concept. It could either be really huge or it could not be scalable. But whenever you're doing something uh, like clean tech, you are like I said, you're trying to disrupt something that's existing, and then uh, the chances of success in clean tech, for example, compared to some of these other areas, is definitely lower. It's like that small town with it's, small narrow roads, and the time lower. it was built. It's lower. But then also, so is so is uh, so is the chances of success in, for example, stuff like uh, pharma, or you know, I mean, I I think there are studies done on. You know, what's the success ratio in, you know, dollars invested versus returns? And I, I think you guys can find this somewhere. But uh, clean tech is not not really up there. It's way down at the bottom. I also feel that, again, it goes down to a storage and transportation issue because a lot of the clean tech that we do have, be it solar, be it hydro, be it uh, hydrogen, be it, you know, uh, biogas or anything of the sort, we have ways of generating it right now. But there's not enough ways of storing it for when we actually need to use it. Today, if you're installing a solar power plant in your house, the biggest spend is not the panels, but the batteries that you need to store the energy that you're creating. So there's a reason why oil, things like oil and coal have been king for, uh, you know, a century or longer, uh, maybe, uh, you know, 150 years ever since the Industrial Revolution. I mean, there's a reason why these things made us uh, advance because they were easy to handle, they were easy to transport, uh, their quantities were enough uh, in terms of the calorific value of energies that they contained. Uh, so there's a reason for all of that. So we are trying to do something very difficult. I, it, it's a fact. You use word. Why, why did you use word and not art? In, in, in what sense? In 
the quantities of oil were. No, they are. Yeah, what I mean to say is, yeah, I mean, now we're saying all of this is really bad, you know, coal is terrible, oil is bad, you know, but the fact of life is it has given us our way of life that we are used to today. And the reason why it has been able to do so is because it carries a good amount of energy within a reasonable quantity of volume and mass, which is easily transportable and stored. Don't you think economics is a very relevant discussion on this front? Because when I talk about the West, they are already built. When I talk about India, it's still building. And they were built on oil, gas, they were built on coal. And now that India is at the verge of getting built, it is all bad. So uh, there are huge uh, discussions, there are huge research papers around this. Um, if you know the, the history of uh, the COPs um, and how the, the progression has taken place. COP stands for? Uh, Conference of Parties, uh, where you know, all of these decarbonization initiatives have taken place. Uh, then yes, absolutely. To begin with, you know, um, the developing world said, listen, we are not the guys who have contributed to all of this. And you are the guys who have created all of this. And, uh, you know, why should we be, you know, a party to trying to stop it where we are trying to raise the economic level of our, our societies? And that's a very good argument. Um, however, uh, the way carbon dioxide works is it's uh, it's accumulative. So uh, it doesn't go away. Basically, you keep accumulating a certain amount of car carbon dioxide over a period of time. And the fact of the matter is uh, that wa what the US and the European uh, zone have done uh, maybe in, in over 100 or 120 years, uh, China and India are probably going to do that in about 50, 60, 70 years. I guess you you have to have some responsibility. Um, I agree with the argument. We can't do it at the expense of the development of our people and our economies. But on a larger scale, we have to realize that uh, being the two fastest growing economies and two of the three largest economies in the world, we are going to cause the same damage in 50, 60 years what it took the US and Europe maybe 100, 120, 130 years to do. So should we be acting on it? I think the larger political consensus even in India is that we should. What's your role in this? Why do you care? How have you gotten from like, as you said, large enterprises to now startups? From my perspective, you know, I'm fascinated by the technology. Uh, I'm fascinated by the fact that we are able to do these kind of things. We're even able to imagine that we can do these kind of things. Because just imagine we are talking about changing the entire energy system. Uh, this is not something small, which is why it is going to take us, even if we are passionately at it, it will take us 30, 40 years to do. Uh, so that's the kind of scale of things that we are talking about. But yeah, you know, I, th I think it's fascinating, you know, that the fact that we've, 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 we are at a stage of development where we can, we can even imagine doing all these things. So I am a young entrepreneur. I just got to know about transition capital and I got to know about you and it's incredible. I hear the word LP. I'm like, he might have a say in whatever is happening in the fund. What should I do to be a part of transition capital? What kind of business am I doing that would really excite you? At Transition Venture Capital, you know, we have, uh, I think we received like about 40, uh, let's say, in IMs uh, a month. Um, we've been active for maybe a year and a half. Information memorandums. So information decks from startups. So let's say if we've been active for about, uh, you know, 18 months and, you know, on average, we receive 30 to 40. So we have a huge, uh, huge reservoir and library of of uh, companies and what we do is we we classify them into sectors uh, so you may have uh, broad sectors like mobility renewables storage hydrogen materials um, you know value added services you know we have we have a chunk of carbon capture we have we have these five six seven major sectors and then we subclassify 
and we subclassify them further down into different sections. Um, so the first thing, if, if you were an entrepreneur with, with uh, you know, an idea is if you would come to us or, you know, you write to us uh, and, you know, first we, we take a look at what you do and we find it interesting. And then we, we, we put it into the library of what we have and we see how many other people are doing it. That's the first thing we see. And then we see, okay, if other people are doing it, how good is, is, is what you are doing? Exactly what you said. How good is your uh, solution statement to the problem compared to what other people are doing? Um, and then so that, that gives us, because we have this over the last 18 odd months, you know, we have this uh, kind of a library of things. Uh, I think we have a better chance of... Uh, of gauging and even advising you whether you're on the right track or not. Uh, then just, I would say a, 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 just let's say a general venture capital investor who may not have uh, dug as deep as we have onto the different sectors. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, like I said, out of the 30 or 40, you know, information memorandums that we get every month, I'd say about 75% are people writing into us and maybe only 20-25% where we hear of somebody and we we, uh, we approach them. It's mostly people uh, that write into us. So you said six, 30 to 40 per month. So let's say it's in the range of somewhere between six to 800 companies that you may have. Yeah. Out of those, how many of those have you invested in? Let's say we are at different stages of investment for four companies. Um, and we have another active maybe a dozen. What does different stages of investment mean exactly? So once you make a uh, once you make an investment decision, you know beyond that there are some procedural uh, things that have to happen. There are some due diligences. There are some uh, you know agreements to be agreed upon. Blah 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 stuff like that. So that's what I mean. Different. But let's say we have agreed to invest on four companies. So we have decided to make your life simpler. Okay. When someone is sending in the information memorandum. What exactly are you looking for? Are you looking more for economic impact, like finances? Are you looking more for the ESG impact, that maybe carbon dioxide focus or something else? What would be like a key filter that you would put in first? So we look at the energy economics. We see, is this claim actually viable? Is this claim really economically viable? Is this solution statement really economically viable to the incumbent or existing way we are doing things? Um, so it's a fairly, we, we, we run fairly technical, um, let's say, hypothesis on this. We do a lot of calculations on our, at our own end. The entrepreneurs also help us with those calculations and things like that. Um, so that's the fundamental point. Is this, is this really viable? Is, is, this is this viable or is this just a dream? Uh, I think the second thing that we would look at is scalability. And that's uh, a standard which is across any venture cap. Uh, anybody who's in venture cap is looking for something that's scalable so that you get, you know, maximum multiplier on your investment. Uh, beyond that, of course, you know, we look at things like team, uh, you know, what is, uh, you know, what is the pedigree of the team in terms of, you know, their qualifications, their background. Uh, we look at their dynamics, their interplay. You know, are they a good cohesive team? Do they have good division of of responsibilities? Um, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then, as I said, we really look at peer comparison. Who else is doing this? Who else is doing this? What? Is, how? How good is this guy compared to the other five guys who are doing this? Is there a time to reality that when will this become something that will be meaningful? Till then, I'll, I'll pull my money till then. I think, yeah. And that's different for different different things. Building from that question, actually. So venture capital is all, almost like, you know, you're at the end of the day, you're making an investment. So you're looking for a return. And clean tech is a disruptive sector. We're looking at changing the ways we think, the way we fundamentally work. So what's the, what are the to sort of timelines that you guys look at? I mean, what are there any basics that you have in your mind that... Mm, I mean, you know, normally venture cap investments look at at least six to eight years minimum uh, so yeah we are we are long-term investors but in some cases we see things happening could happen even faster so 
there's no fixed rule but yeah i would say six to eight years five to seven years something like that is a normal holding period or which we feel a company will evolve to the next level you said you were early stage so what's that can you define early stage a little more so i mean again i, I think you do the post- podcast so but you know people should know you know there's seed capital there's uh, you know pre series a there's series a series b series c you know there are different levels of which and i think I, our sense would be we are anywhere between not really seed but maybe pre series a to series a uh, series a not really series b so the about the second round of funding yeah probably mostly the second round of funding i would say second is is a good is a good word so we've had a lot of investors come on the podcast we've had a lot of vcs come on the podcast you being one of them everyone has a timeline of 6 to 8 years 10 years and then everyone's fund generally started post covid some 2020 2018 what do you think the world looks like 10 years from now or what do you think india looks like 10 years from now if there is like so much happening in like such a concentrated time It's a billion-dollar question. I don't think anybody can tell you what the world looks like ten years from now. Uh, I mean, in this sector, I can just tell you that I think uh, there's a uh, there's a certainly a gradual increase of. Uh, I mean, we, we we think it's dramatic because the figures are very large. Uh, you know, when you hear okay, you know, so many billions of dollars of solar and wind farms and batteries, but if you see the larger scheme of things. there is a gradual chipping away at the older order of energy systems it's gradual it's not dramatic it comes slowly um whether it's uh, electricity whether it's uh, mobility whether it's uh, you know uh, industrial processes it's it's going to happen slowly um i think as far as india goes i i am reasonably bullish on india i think uh, if you look at india we are the third largest energy user and the third largest emitter of carbon in the world but if you look at it on a per capita level we are maybe not even in the top 15 or maybe in the, just barely in the top 15 or top 10 to 15 or something like that um so that means we are going to end up using a lot more energy uh in the future so um yeah i think the future for india is bullish usually the people like the largest economies are the ones who are consuming the most energy so in terms of the increasing energy use i think another stat that came to us was 40% of india's emissions are because of electricity generation that's pretty much the stat uh, between 25 to 40% globally how does that come down how do you see that coming down if our electricity use consumption is going to go up well by by not using uh, newer coal plants and gas plants and using more uh, renewables can there be an immediate switch absolutely not what about nuclear energy has just transition we see look yeah. into that i think we actually did get something once from somebody uh but you know these the, i don't think the area is um let's say i'm not i'm not saying the area is not the the science is not well developed in india but it's probably lying entrenched within you know the large Uh, government organizations and i don't think it's found its way out into the entrepreneurial world yet but uh, yeah nuclear energy has a uh, has a has a great future and a lot of a lot of people in the world are are betting on it if you were to give me the lowest hanging fruit solar power but again solar power i think comes with so many more complications because the efficiency rates are fairly low so the least number of complications solar cars ele- uh, solar power electric cars that's your that's your lowest hanging fruit which is why you have a lot of it around right 5 kilometers a day no 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 you have good range uh, again i'm no, not i think I, he's I talking mean, about solar powered electric cars not solar no, no, power no, no, and no, electric no, cars as two electric cars i'm sorry a lot of venture capitalists in general are also very passive you know they they make the investment and then they let the founders do as they have to when they have certain like you know they have an update coming every so often where do you guys stand and how active are you in the company or how passive are you something i think we're not overly active but at the same time we're not completely passive how do you decide you know more than the founder 
sometimes you don't know more than I mean most times you don't know more than the founder, but you may have links and contacts that know more than the founder. And I think when you have those links and contacts, you activate them. So yeah, I'm not saying that 90% of the times, 95% of the times we don't know more than the founder, but a lot of times we have links and contacts which which might know more than the founder. Do you think companies really accelerate themselves once they get on like a VC? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's uh, it's. I mean, if you need capital to grow, uh, I mean, it's, in some cases you basically need capital to survive and to bring your idea to uh, to reality. Then yeah, yeah. I mean, look. Let's face it. You know, uh, I think India is now maybe the second or third largest venture cap market in the world itself. And you know, you go back to 20, 30 years ago, there was, you know, very little venture cap happening. And, you know, if somebody had a great idea and they didn't have the money, they that's it. Thank you very much, you know. But uh, you know, today it's the capital is available, people are interested, people are interested to invest, people are interested to take take the chance. So I think it makes a difference. I think it makes a difference. You think 20, 30 years, I expected you to say 2018. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I, no, I would say maybe like, you know, I think the venture cap movement started here uh, maybe in the early 2000s. So maybe 20, 30 years ago, it was really, there was nothing. The other thing I feel like with, we spoke about technology and we spoke about the deployment. I think the third thing that comes in is also regulations. How much of a challenge have you guys faced with companies that you've invested in or companies that have come to you where, where regulations are not up to the mark? There have been examples. There have been examples uh, that I have seen where I thought the idea was fantastic. I, I'm, you know, I'm not at liberty to tell you what exactly, but where the regulations just didn't make it uh, possible for the idea to succeed. Can you go global in such a case that it's not going to happen in our country? Maybe it'll happen elsewhere. Global is uh, is is an is a nice word, uh, but going global has has its own set of complications, right? You're you're talking about uh, an entrepreneur that's trying to solve a problem, trying to solve a technological problem, trying to make an economically viable solution, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden you're saying, can you take this global? And then you're adding the complexity of working in a different environment, uh, having to hire a different uh, type of people at a different salary rates, completely different from India. Uh, dealing with far more stringent regulations in some cases in other countries. It's easy to say, it's not easy to do. More than far more stringent regulations, it's a place where, can, where will that particular piece of technology be allowed in that is country? Is that economically, is that problem, is that solution statement viable in that geography? Uh, and if it is very much, then yeah, maybe, you know, pack your bags and go there and you know, look for a new ecosystem there, but then don't say that I'm doing it from here for there, you know, uh, doing it, you know, of course, Indian companies work globally, but then they're very well established here as well, you know. Why do you care? Why does it matter to you? Like it's, how does it matter? You know, the world will be worse long after you'll be dead. As I said, that's not my only motivation. <laughs> Uh, look, let's be honest. Uh, it's it's uh, it's very nice to have the luxury to be thinking. I, I tell some I pe tell people in Europe this. I said, you know, I tell them, look, it's very nice to have the luxury to be thinking about things which are going to affect your grandchildren 30, 40 years from now. There's a lot of people in the world who are worried about what their children are going to eat tonight. So you have to keep things in perspective. Uh, so yes, this is a great thing to do. It's a good thing to do from 20, 30 years from now. It will help the world. But you got to keep things in perspective. And like I said, for me, it's not only about the larger cause, but it's also about the fascination with technology, uh, you know, with the change that we are bringing around in the entire energy system, which is fascinating. On the more raw, who are you? Where do you come from? Who am I? Means I, I, am, a, I am very much a Delhiite. Went to school at Modern School in Delhi. Then I was, uh, uh, I did my engineering studies down south in Manipal. Um, I had a two-year stint in New York where I did an MBA. 
so i'm a i guess i'm a i'm a i'm a guy who likes the technical side of things as well as the business side of things and uh, yeah i like that combination i think that suits me well so if you had to leave like a list of to do's for any aspiring founder what would that be well i think first of all i think you have to have um, a lot of clarity uh, like you said about the problem statement and the solution statement uh, which you are uh, presenting um i think the the next thing is that you have to have uh, again a lot of uh, you know let's say well introspected uh, understanding and conviction of your capabilities to address that uh that that problem statement and that solution statement third i think you need to build uh, strong teams around yourself so normally you'll have co-founders uh very very rarely we see a uh, single individual founder usually it's a bunch of people and i think that that gives them strength it gives us strength as well um and uh, one of the things that i would say and i think this is true for all startups is uh, be realistic i i think what i see nowadays in a lot of uh, startups is people are unrealistic uh you know it's very easy to to show a hockey stick growth and uh, you know we're going to conquer the world you know we are the masters of the universe nobody can survive without us you know we are the next uh, you know i th- i think a little bit of more humility and realism is important uh, get to a position and state stage where you can be more bullish and aggressive about your future Uh, don't be at a state where you are you know you are simply starting out and you are talking about the moon uh, i think i think that's not that's not correct um and at the same time realism also means uh, unfortunately it, sometimes it doesn't mean but i think it should mean that business is also about adding economic value ultimately you need to show some profit if you are going to say look my profit is somewhere on the horizon where i don't even know then i think that's irresponsible and unrealistic so that brings me to a related question like we've come across a lot of founders who or in india especially where this talk of money or talk of finance is looked down upon they're like paise kya hai wo to aa jayenge let's not talk about money no 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 feared yeah it's people fear asking for money people fear money and people fear that the society will look at me more devilishly if i talk more about money like it's looked as as the thing that exists but you cannot talk about it i don't think so i think today's uh, most of people they'll tell you i am already worth a billion dollars i'm in a garage but i am worth a billion dollars <laughs> we, we should get more founders from your fund <laughs> we should get more such founders i tell people a lot i said listen if you are at 10 crores or 15 crores or 20 crores revenue think about 200 crores think about 250 crores don't think about 5000 crores because you will have multiple steps and challenges going from 200 first to 250 then from 250 to 5000 you are at 20 crores and you are saying i'm going to be 5000 crores please pay me for being 5000 crores it doesn't make sense to me Lastly, about competitor analysis, you said you look at you look very closely at who else is in that field. What is better, having two or three people in that field or having nobody else in the field? If we have two three people there, we have a validation that the problem statement and the solution statement are uh, there is consensus among that, and basically we have to find the winner. We have to find the guy who's doing who's doing the best out of it. Having one guy. is great because there's very little competition but then your your entire thesis of the of the solution statement might be completely incorrect i mean it could be just a, a moon shot which is never going to work so um yeah it's it's a tough one so we have a tradition on the podcast where the previous guest has left you a question okay. we would like you to answer that and leave a question for the next guest okay so the question for you is how do you see the impact of ai in your industry in your business and given that what would you advise your children or students or the younger generation on what professions they could pursue as they move from high school to university 
yes there is a lot of um, um, uh, consequences of AI especially in our industry <clears throat> a lot of uh, what uh, what is happening in the clean tech world basically means that there is going to be a lot of variability in demand and supply and a lot of that has to be matched with different resources and things like that and uh, quite honestly the only way to effectively do that is through uh, algorithms which are generated by artificial intelligence so um, yeah I think it has a huge effect I really am not an expert to say what industries or what professions this uh, affects more and uh, what it doesn't but I think if somebody was to ask me I would say just you know if you follow your heart and study or go after whatever whatever profession you want because if you're good at it I think you will certainly you know have a scope I mean I don't think AI will replace the humans that are controlling the AI so I think in every profession while there will be AI there will be people uh, controlling that AI and if you're good at that profession then you will be one of those guys.